Hi, I'm Bill, and if this is the first time dropping into the channel, welcome. I'm uh, down in uh, Landers, California, where Goat Mountain Astronomical Research Station is located. It's run by the Riverside Astronomical Society. If you're looking for a good club in the Southern California area, I would suggest you check out uh, Riverside Astronomical uh, Society. So. Um, this uh, video is going to be about something I found out as a beginner. When you're a beginner, you, you can learn something new every day if you want. And uh, what I learned was the importance of uh, dark skies. I mean, I kind of had an idea that if you can, it's better to, dark, uh, to image from a darker sky. But I really didn't know why or what, uh, to what magnitude. So. Um, um, but before we get into that, I just want to say I've gotten the uh, first uh, photons to hit the sensor on my ASI 533 uh, MC Pro. Uh, last night I imaged uh, M101, and uh, in the next couple of days I'll put that image together. Uh, it was very windy out here, so I'm not sure about my guiding and those type of things, but at least it gave me uh, eight, nine hours of running the camera. Uh, and powering it and making sure it functioned well and it worked well with the luminous filter I know backspace issues using my filter wheel and everything so but um, All right, let's uh, let's go inside the van and uh, let's dig into the topic of why darker skies matter Okay back to the question at hand why dark sites matter answering that question why again, you know every day as a beginner you can learn something new and so I was doing some research thinking about well maybe I should buy a sky quality meter uh, I'm gonna try and get out to different sites uh, along the course of this year and um, I thought okay it'd be good to measure the sky quality and I think it's about 149 bucks but anyway I came across uh, this uh, equation it was on uh, cloudy nights there was a discussion about sky quality and its importance and you know I understood that there is a benefit to imaging from darker skies I think most people understand that but what I never understood was to what magnitude to what factor and so um, I started to think about this equation and I cross-referenced it on uh, another site and it seems to be a viable equation that people use to measure the, uh, the difference in sky, uh, sky quality between sites and then what would be the equivalent time required to um, image from a sky uh, skies that are more light polluted than less light polluted and so what I'm showing here is if I run the equation for my Bortle 7 8 skies in San Mateo California versus a Bortle 1 uh, site uh, which I'm going to be going to the Golden State Star Party up in the Aden area of Northern California it's a portal one site if anyone's going there registrations open just let me know and I'd be happy to meet up with you there um, so um, then I started to run some numbers and again your numbers for uh, the sky quality may vary from mine um, but what I did was then I figured out a factor so if I was to image for one hour in a Bortle 1 under Bortle 1 skies um, and then I would go to let's say a Bortle 4 where I'm at currently at Goat Mountain Astronomical Research Station in Landers, California what would be the equivalent imaging time I would need so the factor would be 1.35 so for one hour of imaging in a Bortle under Bortle 1 skies uh, here and I'm not sure if this is a Bortle 3 or Bortle 4 or in between but let's just call it a Bortle 4 I would need to image 1.35 hours to get the equivalence of a one hour of imaging under uh, Bortle 1 skies and again you know it's pretty straightforward right we're all trying to optimize 
uh, signal and uh, reduce uh, the amount of uh, noise. So, um, so here are some factors based on the uh, sky, sky quality uh, numbers I used. Uh, and yes, there are other factors that are uh, involved, like seeing, and I'm sure other elements as well. Um, and then, um, so what I did then is say it ain't so, because I really couldn't believe it. Um, so, you know, but is it? And, and maybe it is. Uh, maybe that equation is a, is a good uh, equation. Again, uh, some variables uh, aside, but for that one hour of imaging underneath uh, Bortle One Skies, it's telling me I need 21.34 hours of imaging time underneath my Bortle 7. Um, and, you know, that kind of shocked me, to tell you the truth. Uh, and, uh, you know, many factors. I mean, yes, there's a convenience from imaging from uh, your home. And, yeah, there are ways to mitigate the light pollution uh, by going uh, monochrome and narrow band or going one shot color and maybe an Optolong L Extreme. Uh, but, you know, if, if this equation is true and it holds, you know, it, it's just kind of shocking to me that I would need, you know, 21.34 hours of imaging time to be the equivalent of one hour under Bortle One uh, skies. And, you know, think of what comes into play here, you know, that, you know, on a good night, maybe you get uh, six, seven hours. So now you're looking at 21 hours and that you need three good, three good nights. So you need, you know, that weather to hold for you across uh, three nights. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, like last night, I think I imaged, I got about five, five hours of uh, the pinwheel galaxy time in and uh, you know if I was at home trying to do the equivalent uh, uh, imaging to get the type of uh, signal to noise ratio that I want to achieve uh, 106 hours would be needed I mean this is just shocking to me so you know I want to say it ain't so and uh, but really is it and uh so that's um you know this was just kind of shocking to me and uh you know i kind i thought i would share it um you know but what does it really mean in the end i mean yes i think we all knew that there was value in imaging under dark skies i mean it's quite clear that the photons arriving from deep sky objects are fixed but the photons arriving from the foreground sky, you know, will vary on uh, light pollution. Um, and, uh, you know, so to the extent you can take that variability of the foreground sky out, uh, you know, then definitely there's a, a clear uh, benefit. And then, uh, you know, because that then allows for uh, uh, the best contrast between the uh, deep sky object and the sky foreground. Um, and, uh, you know, think about it if the last time you maybe, maybe you're fortunate to image from a Bortle 1 uh, zone all the time. I've really only been out to one Bortle 1 zone, and that was out where they have Burning Man. And clearly, you know, there's so many more stars, it's so much darker and you don't have that foreground uh, light polluted uh, sky to, con, uh, to contend with there. But uh, I also think it means don't let uh, light pollution stop you from uh, starting to do imaging from your home. It's clear that many great images are produced under heavily light polluted uh, skies. There are mitigation techniques uh, that you can uh, implement and uh, while it may take you a little bit longer to capture the amount of signal that you need, uh, 
you know, it's it's doable. I mean, it's done probably every night where there's a clear sky. Somebody's out there in a light polluted area, and they're uh, they're imaging, and then they process those images, and they take the noise out, and uh, and those type of things, and they create some really nice uh, images. Um, something that I've been uh, kind of advocating for, you know. Uh, is uh, encouraging people to check out their local astronomical society clubs. Uh, they would be the people who would know where they go for darker skies in your immediate area. Um, yes, often you have to travel. And uh, yes, when you travel, you need to bring your own power. Uh, but it's doable, uh, you know, if you're in a position uh, uh, to do that. It's something that uh, uh, you should maybe consider and just do your own uh, uh, test and acquire some first-hand knowledge of your own to see if the time you spend under a darker sky, uh, is there any discernible difference in the quality of those images compared to where you're maybe imaging in a more uh, light uh, polluted uh, sky. So, um, you know, um, that equation kind of, uh, that function that uh, kind of shocked me, uh, but I believe it's accepted uh, in uh, astronomy and, um, and uh, oh, sky and telescope. They also have an article here, which I, you know, was my cross cross reference, and it's it's a good read. I'll put a link uh, to this article in the description of this video, and where he gets into a rule of thumb using 2.51 as a factor uh, based upon the magnitude of the sky. So uh, it, you know, just uh, might be something uh, that you want to check out, just so you know. Uh, what the opportunities might be if you can get into a lower bordal area uh, without too much trouble. Uh, it might be something you want to do, but I, I gotta admit, the you know having imaged a few times from my uh, from my ha house, uh, being able to set everything up, put it on remote, uh, you know, automatic, and just kind of be comfortable inside, uh, checking on things every once in a while when it gets time for the meridian flip. To make sure there's no cable snags and everything is uh, can be very productive. So if you have to spend a few more nights because you're in a more light polluted area, you know it's basically an automatic operation if you have the right configuration for your telescope with auto focusing and and uh, maybe a filter wheel and, and those type of things. So okay. So um, again, I hope uh, this information was of help. I would like to hear your feedback. Uh, do you buy into this uh, equation? Is it your experience that clearly darker skies are a benefit uh, based upon uh, your configuration? Uh, just kind of share your thoughts um, on this topic and uh, as always feel free to ask any comments, uh, you know, any questions or comments. Uh, other than that, if you like this kind of content, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, as always, like, share, and subscribe. Other than that, see you next time.